right, we're uh, we're here at the at the wrap up, and then we're going to have a nice little party um, afterwards to celebrate the birthday, and I'll share my tequila for those who stuck around. But but I want to um, thank you for being here uh, today. We tried to expose you to the breadth of things that we're doing and really look into the future. I think you remarkably thoughtful group of, of people on the panels and keynotes. I can't thank them enough um, for all that they've done. A little bit of denouement for me or, or is, you know, I was telling you the story about Lord Brown and my 12 and 10 year old. Well, one will be 26 in two weeks and he'll get his master's from the Jackson School of Geosciences this year, if he's lucky. And the other one will be 24 and he'll get his master's in petroleum engineering this year from UT as well. And so part of what we do is just pass on what we can to the next generation and I know Sharon's daughter graduated from this school as well, and, and, and I think we do a pretty good job of that. That's outreach of its own kind, is to carry on to the next gen. It's really a privilege for me to introduce um, our two closing speakers, one of whom you know, Dean Moser, will speak at the end, but uh, next is Chuck Williamson. Chuck uh, has a PhD from this uh, university in geosciences. He's been on the Jackson School Advisory Council for many years. He's been on my board at the Bureau since we formed a board uh, 16, now 17 years ago. Former chairman and CEO of Unical, chairman of Warehouser now. He's run lots of things in his life and uh, a great friend of many of us and I found Chuck to be one of the more cogent thinkers of big picture things and how science and society and business tie together and he's had to do that. He's seen it all. So. He's going to summarize and share some thoughts that he's picked up from the day, and we're really pleased to have him, and then Sharon will follow after that, and we'll have a birthday party. So, Chuck, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks. Chuck, let me get out of this. So I'm just trying Excuse me. Just While Mark me. exits uh, the screen, I'll just tell you, I don't have any PowerPoint slides. It's all good. While he's doing that, let me just, uh, first of all, say what a great day. And Scott... Our appreciation to you for organizing a fantastic program. I can't think of a better tribute to Jack and Katie and, and what they've done. So thank you so very much for that. Unlike what Scott introduced me as, I'm not going to try to summarize the whole day. So sit tight. It's OK. <laughs> I'm leaving a heavy lifting to Sharon. <laughs> but I do want to just give you a couple thoughts. And I noticed in the program the way it said final thoughts. And I'm hoping these really aren't my final thoughts. You know, but. <laughs> But I will give you just a couple of very high-level takeaways. And, you know, first of all, I, I've enjoyed and it's been a real privilege to be on this advisory council. So we've gotten to see the progress of this school over the last 10 years. And it has been, I think, more than we could have ever anticipated, thanks to Sharon's leadership, Scott's, and everybody else involved here. So on behalf of the advisory council, I'd like to thank the people that made this all happen. And I think Jim said it best. Uh, Jack provided the fuel, but you guys are the engine and made it happen. And then secondly, I don't see Peter here, but I want to recognize Bill and Peter because long before the Jackson School, long before the Jackson School, these two guys have been hugely important to this whole effort. And the commitment and dedication, Bill, that you and Peter have shown, it's just remarkable to me. So thank you. So when Scott asked me to do this, I had no idea what was going to be discussed till we got here today, other than the topics that Jack had outlined in his letter. I, I will say my takeaway is, is really positive, because I came here fearing that we would hear a lot of in-depth technical things that really had little bearing on some of our great global challenges. And that was not the case. And George, thank you for kicking it off with the overarching global challenges. I don't have any of those to offer, but I thought the stage you set was exactly right. Uh, you know, to me, what's important in the geosciences right now is we have to stay in the conversation. And I don't care if it's with public policymakers or your neighbors or whoever it is. We, in order for the earth sciences to keep its importance and relevancy, all the research that we heard about today has really got to be aimed at some of the grand challenges. And they really need to be aimed at things that are societally relevant. And I say that uh, not news to anyone in this room. I think we heard that from every panel today. Is it, it's no longer, and I think, Mark, you said it best, you have to have technical excellence. There's no question in your discipline. Or you can't pick the research that makes a meaningful impact. But it's got to be more than that now. 
And I think uh, for people, young people and the grad students that are up here, you heard that. So we want whatever we do in our research efforts, not only to go to the public policy makers, I want to educate a broader segment of the public, period. The scientific literacy in this country stinks, period. And so, you know, I would encourage all of you to be advocates, advocates. And Scott said it best, Jack liked leverage. Jack liked, he was a businessman, just like I am. And he loved leverage, and we heard it from Don on how to leverage the research. But leverage for all of us is reaching more and more people. And they don't all have to be policymakers. That's even better if they are. But I encourage all of you, you know, to, to use your science and to get out and about, whether it's outreach or whether it's talking to your neighbor. And the only story I can tell you in a very short period of time, I live in this very green town called Sonoma, California. And it's a beautiful town. But one day there was a letter to the editor over the leaf blowers, all right? We've all heard the controversy over leaf blowers. And one of the writers attributed the swarm of many earthquakes we had had to the leaf blowers. That did it. <laughs> I've tried to stay quiet, but you know, that was just too much. <laughs> I should have called you, Mark. <laughs> but I mean, I think that's the point. What we heard today in terms of the research that's being done here all has a context. And, and I think you heard the grad students say it best. Gee, I, you know, I, I kind of want to know where I fit with this piece that I'm doing because it becomes more meaningful to people and it becomes much more meaningful, frankly, for our science and advancing it. So that was my one big takeaway. I liked what I heard. I think people are all thinking that way, whether it's the environment, whether it's oil and gas, heat, electricity. The big challenge we all face is just what Steve said, is that we've got a growing population, dwindling resources. We need more electricity, transportation fuels. We need heat. We need water. We need access to mineral resources. And this is the science and the integrative part that can really contribute to that. So I like hearing that a lot. Uh, and I think as an advisory council member, that's been a really positive part of the school. I'm not going to tick off all the good things that Sharon and the rest have done. But putting these units together has allowed it to be more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and frankly aimed at some of the bigger problems. So I'm not going to talk a lot more. I'm going to leave a little more time for Sharon, who actually does research, or maybe used to do research here. Maybe that's fair. And so I'm not as in touch with it as I might be, but I can tell you that this school's made great progress. And I think if there's anything to take away is that we have the expertise here. It, not just scale, but diversity. We have the sort of the copus of what it takes to address some of these big issues. But I still think there's room to focus them, to, to stay focused on the resource issue, stay focused on the environmental issues, and really make a difference. And, and that's what you know research at the end of the day should be about. So thank you all for your attention. I'm going to let Sharon summarize much more succinctly than I can. I'm smart enough to know when to delegate, Scott. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Chuck. I have to say that your support, the support of the Geology Foundation, uh, the support of our alumni, and the support of all the faculty, research scientists, students, and uh, technical and support staff of the Jackson School is really critical. And without all of that support, we would not be able to do what we did today and would not be able to you know, contribute to uh, society in the future. And we really appreciate your support very much. Uh, today was absolutely fascinating. I really, really enjoyed the entire day. You never know what to expect. It's sort of like when you have a party, you don't know if anybody's going to come. You know, when you have an event like this, you don't know what anybody's going to say. So uh, this has just been wonderful. Um, I'm going to say a few uh, brief words about each panel. Um, and they're brief, so no offense to <laughs> the panels. Um, first of all, the first panel on geology, George did a fantastic job of laying out not only what the grand challenges are, but what the overarching grand challenges are, and really the way that we can pull ourselves together to address not just the grand challenges, but build groups that can uh, try to tackle these overarching ones. 
Uh, the second panel on geophysics, I was really interested in how geophysics is going to save the world. <laughs> it opened my eyes. And also was very impressed by the idea of, and not just for geophysics, but overall, separating signal from noise. Because we do have a tendency, things are messy data, there's things that don't fit, you know, all sorts of things that we tend to throw out, when in fact, that's actually trying to tell us something. And really focusing on those kinds of things make, make a big difference. Uh, the panel after lunch, I think, was a great example of how one should do philanthropy, how you cultivate uh, donors and really basically best practice, you know, philanthropy at its best. Really making sure that the, the donors are contributing to the things that they feel passionate about, the things that they really, really care about. Uh, the, pan the next panel, I think, really outlined them uh, somewhat grimly at times, the major challenges of the 21st century and really showed some of the things that we as geoscientists really have to do if we're going to address these sorts of grand challenges. And then the last panel, I was really taken by the uh, phrase, use-inspired basic research. I mean, I think that is really something that should be a motivating factor. Uh, and also the need for well-informed environmental decision-making, and in particular, for taking science to decision makers. Uh, not, you know, not trying to do policy, but trying to inform policy by the science that we actually do. And I will go on to say that everything we heard today fits extremely well with the Jackson School's mission, which is to advance understanding of the Earth, its resources, systems, environment, for the lasting benefit of humankind. It also fits with our vision. Uh, we integrate research and education, both because we want to create future uh, geoscience leaders, but also because we want to really investigate similarities and differences between geoscience processes that actually shaped the Earth, that shaped it in the past and are going to shape it in the future. And something that was said in the first panel really struck me. I mean, we really need to understand the Earth, how it has undergone transitions in time, and how it undergoes or has undergone transitions in space. And how do those changing tra those transitions, how do those changes affect conditions and change conditions? So those conditions impact uh, the Earth itself, and also impact life. So basically, how do planets work? I mean, how do all the different parts of the system interact with each other, and the processes in one impact the processes in others? You know, how do you know we use chemistry and physics and biology and math and computational modeling and things like that uh, to really look at and solve geoscience problems? and figure out the processes and how those processes actually work. I mean, what, you know, when water flows through a reservoir, I mean, what, not only how does it flow, but what is the chemistry that's going on? What is the biological reactions going on? And what impact does that have on what comes out or, or where it's going? I think most of the talks and discussions today really stressed that we really need to address first order geoscientific uh, societal problems, the challenges of the 21st century. Things like water, energy, natural hazards, natural resources, climate, life, land use, and soils. All those things were mentioned today. And obviously we need to produce the next generation of geoscientists that are going to go out and solve the problems of the 21st century. We need to do what we do, which is blend study of the geologic record with study of the modern day. Because only by looking at the short and long-term uh, processes can we really try to forecast what's going to happen in the future. So what, what do I think our goals should be? 
Well, I think we should, as somebody said, we should be continuing down the same uh, general path that we have been in trying to address fundamental geoscience questions, but really maybe focusing on some of these transitions that take place both in space and time and looking at coupling of processes and coupling of different parts of the Earth system and the changes in conditions and do all that with the goal of trying to not just advance the geosciences, but also really impact and make a difference for society itself. We also obviously, as was pointed out, really need to be focusing on education of students and really integrating the students into research and making sure that they, they don't just know optical mineralogy and know what a 2B is, but they actually understand the concepts and have the skills and competencies so they can go out and be successful in the workplace. And that's not just you know, courses, but it's really the experiences uh, that they will have. And we never should forget that at the Jackson School, research and education are intimately intertwined. Because one, we as researchers learn from our students partially because they ask us questions we don't know the answers to. And they learn by having to solve questions and problems. And I really was taken with something that Emily said about how, as a student, you know, learning how to talk as a geoscientist and then having to struggle to talk as a geoscientist back to, to the public. And I think that's something we really need to stress not just for our students, but also for the rest of us. We need to be able to go and talk to state agencies or you know, uh, legislature in Washington and explain what we do and why is it important so that they can make informed decisions and so they understand the science. I think we need to continue to focus on societal pro problems of societal rel relevance. Uh, looking at how the Earth will change by 2050 or let's say 2100, as David mentioned, I think is a great goal. And to do so, we have to look at the processes today, but also the processes in the past. I think the Jackson School is well, petition, well positioned to approach the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, some of the things that were mentioned today were providing access to clean water for human consumption, uh, providing a diverse natural environment, securing affordable energy resources while minimizing environmental, environmental impact for extraction, and predicting and managing the effects of you know, human behavior on the habitat. Uh, another thing that was mentioned today is, you know, how do we manage extreme events, be they flooding, be they droughts, be it ice sheet collapse, uh, things of that nature. And we need to look at it both on the local scale and the regional scale, but also on the global scale. And each of those, and that came across very clearly, I think, today, that scale in terms of local to regional to global and scale in terms of seconds to minutes to years to decades to centuries to uh, millions of years or billions, as I'm used to working with, makes a big difference, and that's something we have to think about. We're also well positioned to investigate some of the things that were talked about in the first panel in terms of coupling of different parts of the Earth system and coupling of processes. You know, we study and we're interested in things like mantle convection and plate tectonics and evolution of surface topography and formation of basins and maturation of uh, organic material within these basins and things of those nature. And we're also, and this got mentioned in, I think, the last panel about paleo or paleontology, we're well positioned to investigate changing conditions at temporal boundaries and the impact that has had on life in the past, both in terms of mass extinctions as well as mass survival. So today, I think we've heard many stimulating and thought-provoking ideas on the future of the geosciences and on the types of grand challenges and also directions that the Jackson School can and should take, both to explore and also hopefully solve some of these major societal issues and to move forward. Now it's up to us.
It's a time for us to move forward and move into the future. And with Jack and Katie's investment, we have the wherewithal to be able to do that. And with the support of our alumni and the support of the members of the school and our friends, that will help us in moving forward that way. So we are eternally grateful to Jack and Kath, Katie's uh, investment in the University of Texas at Austin, and most specifically to the geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. And we have been trying and will continue to try to fulfill their vision to the best of all of our abilities. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank all the participants uh, this has just been a fascinating day. I've enjoyed it immensely. And rarely do I say that when I've sat in a room in a hard chair for, what, eight hours, 12 hours, something like that. So thank you for coming to celebrate the incredible legacy of Jack and Katie uh, Jackson. And with, like all great birthdays, we have cake. So we're going to have a, a reception. Uh, there is a birthday cake, but I may have finished a little too soon, but they're going to bring in a birthday cake. But I will warn you, there will be no candles. You know why? 10 candles would be a fire hazard for UT. I'm not kidding. So celebrate, enjoy, thank you all.